it's a joy for me to introduce and pray for Mark Middleberg. Mark and his wife Heidi are here with us. Uh, their son Matthew and their daughter Emma Jean are off other places because they're grown up. Uh, but Mark and I have been partnering together in ministry of helping people in local churches naturally share their story and the story of God's love uh, for a quarter century. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a long time, yeah. doesn't it? So, uh, so I trust Mark with my whole heart as a leader and as a teacher, and I'm so thankful. So I want to pray for God's blessing on him and for your hearts to be open here in the worship center, family worship venue, and online. They've got to open your hearts to learn. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for Mark. Thank you for a friendship that's lasted oh, through the years and a partnership in ministry. Lord, I know that he loves this church, that he prays for all that's happening here. So Lord, we pray that you would anoint him and fill him with power to share this great, impactful message, this embedded with pictures and images that make us say, I can be part of God's work. I can do this. And so anoint him and prepare us. Let each one of us here in the worship center, family worship venue and online, if we're a follower of Jesus, prepare us to learn and have an aha moment where we say, I want to be part of the adventure, the amazing, unexpected, surprising venture, adventure of sharing the love of Jesus. And Lord, for anyone who's listening that doesn't yet know you, uh, Lord, may, may they see themselves as part of your story already, Lord, that you're loving them and reaching out to them. So bless this time and prepare us to learn. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Would you welcome amen. Mark? Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Kevin. It is so great to be here at Shoreline. We had a great day yesterday with a little uh, conference we did. I met many of you then, but I would, it's great to be with you all today. I don't know if you uh, relate to this idea that your life as a Christian can be an adventure. I think sometimes we think, you know, those are two different categories. Adventure is exciting. It's kind of scary. It's a little danger. And my Christian life is sort of predictable. And Well, that's the problem. And I think, I think sometimes we have to stretch ourselves and go on an adventure of following God, even when it feels a little scary, uh, to make it an adventure. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I live in uh, Colorado, and I love to ride bike. And uh, for me, riding my mountain bike is an adventure, and it's partly true because I don't just ride around the church parking lot on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I get out where there's a little danger. In fact, where we live in Colorado, we have really big bears in our neighborhood. And I'll tell you, the adrenaline rush of being on a bear, bears look big from the car. You should try seeing one from a bike. <laughs> they're really big, and thankfully, they're pretty, they stay to themselves. But I get an adrenaline rush when I go on a bike ride, partly because there's a little danger there, and I'm stretching myself a little bit, and I come home and go, that was fun. Well, in our Christian life, again, if you want your life to be an adventure, you got to stretch a little. And if you want an unexpected adventure, stretch yourself in this area that I know you hear a lot about from Kevin and the staff, in the area of outreach, where you share the good news that has changed your life and changed your eternity. You share it with other people, and you'll be unexpectedly on an adventure that is like none other. And that's what I want to encourage you with. The problem is, I think a lot of us don't want to stretch in that area because we have a kind of a mental image of what it looks like. And it's like, I got to be something I'm not. I got to be someone God didn't make me to be. I'm not Kevin Harney. Or I'm not, you know, you name the leader or person that you think of that's really good at that. And what I want to say is, I agree with you, I'm not either. And we all have our unique personalities. God's made us in our own way. And he wants us to get in the, on the adventure in ways that fit who he made us to be. Now, that's true, but I know some of you don't believe me yet. So here's what I want to do in this message. I'm just going to tell you a story. And then I'm going to draw six examples out of my story of various things people did, did in this. And it's a true story from my life. But it's various things people did that I'm betting you can do at least one of. And for some of you, you will say, I could do that and that and this. You know, maybe you're a combination of these approaches. But uh, you'll see what I mean when I get to that part. But for now, here's the story. Years ago, I was trying to get a book written. And I also worked at a church in Chicago that was really busy, thousands of people. And I was in charge of a ministry area. And I just couldn't get the book written. I just was too busy. And finally, a friend who was a board member of our ministry there 
a friend named Carl said, why don't you just get out of here? Uh, why don't you come down to where I live? He lived in Dallas. He said, I'll let you use my guest house over on the other side of the pool. This was sounding pretty good. Um, <laughs> And he said, you'll have it to yourself. And oh, by the way, what is what is it like in January in Chicago, he asked me. And I said, tell me more, let's talk. Uh, so anyway, we worked it out. I went down there for five weeks and just focused, and got most of this book written just in those five weeks at his house. It was wonderful. But what I would do is I'd work day and night and I, you know, just trying to get so much done. And Carl would go off to work. And just a quick snapshot of Carl. He's a hard-hitting leader, business type, uh, type A personality. In fact, I think he's certifiably a triple A type uh, A personality. Um, he, this guy buys and sells businesses as casually as I change socks. I mean, this guy just is a heavy hitter, and he's been doing this for many years. Uh, and he has a sweet wife, Barbara, who I'll tell you about in a little bit. Um, but Carl would go off and, you know, buy and sell kingdoms or whatever he was doing, and then he'd come back at the end of the day, and I'd been writing, and sometimes we'd grab dinner, but I remember one particular day, he said, I already ate, it was a little later in the evening, he said, but I heard about a new ice cream shop that just opened on the north side of Dallas here. I said, I'm in, say no more, let's go. So we get in his car, and I want to kind of reenact a little of what we experienced that day. Uh, we parked over there in the parking lot. And I got out first, and I came, and here's the front door of this ice cream shop. It was a long, narrow deal. I opened the door, and along the front here is the windows, and there's little tables and chairs where people eat their ice cream sundaes. And then the aisle's in the middle, and then over here is the counter, the guy behind the till, you know, the cash register, then the ice cream, uh, you know, glass where you look in and pick your flavors. But I noticed as soon as I came in, there was a board, a chalkboard, where they write the flavor of the day. And so, like, I'm on a mission to figure out what I'm having, so I beeline it over here. I look up, and it says, white chocolate mousse. I'm going, is that even a flavor? What is that? It just sounds foofy. I don't know about that. And I'm thinking about that, but Carl comes in right behind me, and he comes through the same door and notices the guy behind the counter. And Carl's gregarious, the part I didn't tell you about Carl, he also, he's not just a hard-hitting businessman, he loves people, he loves God, and he loves introducing them to each other. He's just real outgoing and a real out, outreach kind of person. So he comes in, notices the guy behind the counter, and says, hey, how you doing? The guy says, I'm doing fine. And Carl knows this right away, this guy has an accent, not like a Texas accent, uh, and he looks at him, he goes, you know, based on your appearance and based on your accent, I'm guessing you're from the Middle East. The guy goes, well, matter of fact, I am. We found out later he was from Syria. And Carl said, well, if you're from the Middle East, then I'm just curious. Are you a Muslim? Are you a Christian? What are you? <laughs> Nothing like being politically correct, right? So I'm over here, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I double-checked the board. I'm going, maybe the... Flavor of the day is really rocky road, you know? <laughs> I, how is this gonna go down? I'm thinking we've been in this ice cream shop about eight seconds now, and Carl already offended a guy. Way to go, Carl. Wow, that's a record. That's, that's amazing. But I was really curious to see how this guy was gonna respond. And honestly, he was a little shocked by Carl. Um, kind of like, whoa, well, you know, that's an interesting question. He said, uh, you know, I grew up in a Muslim country and a Muslim family, and that's really all I've ever known. And, uh, but I'm not real religious and devout about it. He said, so, you know, I've, I've lived here in the States for a couple of years. I've met a lot of nice Christians. Honestly, I don't quite know what to think of the whole thing. I guess I'm somewhere in the middle. Well, Pavlovian's dog over here started salivating. I mean, Carl got like excited about this. He's, I could just see the gears turning. And, and he, he goes, well, that's interesting. He goes, my name's Carl. And the guy goes, my name's Fies. And they shake hands. And then Carl, he's like kicking into evangelist mode, right? You know, so, and he also kicked into boss mode because he's had lots of people working for him. And so he looks over at me and he orders me to come over. You know, Mark, come here. You know, so I march over. And uh, <clears throat> he goes, I want you to meet my new friend, Fize. Fize, this is Mark. He said, he said uh, Fize, Mark studies these things and he writes books on this stuff and so he can answer your questions. And then he looks at me, he goes, Mark, Fize is a Muslim, and he wants to know about Jesus. Tell him about Jesus. <laughs> that, was, that was Fize's response. It's like, really? I don't remember asking. 
And, uh, but he didn't say that. He just looked at me nervously. And honestly, I looked at him nervously because it's like, well, Carl said we got to talk about this. So, okay, uh, let's go. Ready. And so I, I took a deep breath and I just kind of said, you know, um, you follow Muhammad and I follow Jesus, and yeah, I know they're both religious leaders, but there's a big difference between how they lived, what they did, what they taught. And I got going, I thought, this is pretty good. I'm kind of on a roll, and this isn't so bad, and I'm talking to him, and, and this is stuff I study. This is stuff I've, I enjoy talking about, just not usually over an ice cream counter. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of getting on a roll, and then someone comes in the door and wants to buy ice cream. So I step back and let this rude person come and uh, <laughs> get their ice cream. And then they go sit at one of these little tables over here. And then I step up and I'm going, okay, let's try this again. I go, okay, so you read the Quran and you think that's the word of God. I follow the Bible, which is the word of God. And, uh, and there's a big difference between these messages. And, you know, so I'm, I'm on that roll and it's going pretty well. I'm feeling pretty good. And then another one of these pesky customers comes in the door. <laughs> And, you know, wants to buy ice cream. So I step back. And, and about the third time I made my attempt and we're getting interrupted, I finally looked at Fives. I said, you know, this is kind of awkward, isn't it? He's, yeah. And I go, I'll make a deal with you. How about if we don't talk about this right now? He goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, but it's really important to talk about sometimes. So here's what I'll do. I said, I have a good friend, a, a guy I write books with and stuff, uh, who was a former atheist who studied all the evidence for Jesus and wrote a book called The Case for Christ. Uh, my friend's name is Lee Strobel. And I said, um, we'll bring you a copy of his book, The Case for Christ. It talks about a lot of what we were trying to talk about. And if you'd read that, I think you'd find it really encouraging. He goes, I'd like to do that. If you'd really bring it to me, that'd be great. So it'd be great. We got our ice cream. We left. We went back to Carl's house. I said, give me a copy of The Case for Christ. And Carl actually buys them by the case and gives them out. But uh, he was out. And he said, all I have is my first edition hardcover copy that Lee personally wrote. I said, give me that book. You got us in this thing. Dear Carl, let's see here. Dear Fies. Let's, uh. <laughs> and so I, I said, we're going over. So a couple nights later, I took Carl's book that I had absconded from him and said, we're going to give this to this guy. And we went back in. And honestly, I didn't know how this guy would react. You know, like, here comes these two radicalized Christians. And, uh, and, you know, I thought he might duck behind the counter. He didn't. He actually smiles. Hey, you guys come back. Did you bring me that book? I'm like, yeah. It's like, this guy's really interested. And that's where I first got the sense, that, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit's actually up to something. And I said, well, yeah, here's the book. And I told him a little, look, he wrote in it to you. Um, <laughs> I didn't do that. But... Uh, but we gave it to him, and uh, he, he, he really seemed to appreciate, said he would read it. We got our ice cream. We left. And that was toward the end of my five weeks in Texas. And I flew back again. I lived in Chicago at the time, flew back home. And I, you know, I thought, I'll pray for this guy when I think of him, and who knows what God might do, maybe as he reads Lee's book. What I didn't realize is Carl, Mr. Goal-Oriented Man, he was like locked in on something here. He kept going back. And uh, then he would go and uh, talk to his wife, Barbara, and he'd say, you know, like sometimes they'd have a little time of prayer in the evening together, and he'd say, we got to pray together for my friend Fize, this Muslim guy I've been telling you about. Um, I, you know, I think he's pretty open. He's reading the book and, and so on. And Barbara, who's a sweetheart. By the way, Barbara, you know, like opposite of Carl. She's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> And uh, she's just a southern belle, you know, Dallas. She's got that great Texas accent. And she, she's, I can't imitate it, but she said to Carl, you know, she said, you know, Carl, I'll pray for your friend Fies, but, you know, I like ice cream too. And he's going, hey, you want to go over there? And she's going, what? I thought you'd never ask. Let's, let's go. So they went over to the ice cream shop, and Carl introduces Fies to his wife, Barbara, and she did the most amazing thing, something Carl and I never thought of. She asked the guy, like, about his family. And uh, you have a wife, oh, you have a daughter, that's interesting. She really warmed it up relationally. And then, before they were done, I don't think Carl had quite counted on this, she had invited them to their home. You know, you have a wife and daughter, you've got to come have dinner with us. So the guy's like, that'd be wonderful. So he took the invitation. Pretty soon, they're having dinner at Carl and Barb's house, 
And if you know anything about the Middle East, uh, it's hospitality oriented. So now they had to invite Carl and Barb and, and wanted them to come and enjoy some of their food. And Carl and Barb said yes. And a real friendship was forming. So it was really a, a cool thing. Well, here's another part of the story. Carl and Barb are part of a large church on the north side of Dallas, and they're part of a very large uh, adult Sunday school class of about 100 people. And at the end of each class, each Sunday, they take prayer requests. And so one Sunday, they said, hey, you want to have something you, know, you want us to all pray for? And Carl said, actually, I do. I, I have this friend. He's a Muslim. His name's Fize. He's a great guy. He's become a friend to Barbara and me. And I've told a few of you about it. But if you'd all pray, uh, that you know, God would really help him to see that you know, Christ died for all of us. And he needs to follow Christ as well. And they said, well, you know, kind of like Barbara, they're like, well, we'd love to pray for your friend Fize. But, you know, Carl, we like ice cream too. Where is this place? And he's like, wow, great idea. And he jumps up to the chalkboard and says, Fize, he spells it. You know, here's the, where the map to where this new ice cream shop is. And why don't you all go over there? You know, all y'all go over there and, uh, you know, reach out to him. And so you see what God's doing here? He has just unleashed a hundred hungry Baptists <laughs> on this poor Muslim guy who doesn't know what's about to hit him. Um, but the good news is ice cream sales were up, and, and all these people that all kind of looked and sounded like Carl are all coming and going, we're friends with Carl and Barbie. There's no kidding, really. Uh, and so he's meeting all these nice people. And of course, they're buying ice cream, but they're giving him a book to read and a tape to listen to and all this. The other thing they would do, and Carl and Barbara were doing as well, is they would invite him to their church. And they'd say, you know, you, you really, you ought to visit our church. He's going, is that legal? Um, I'm a Muslim, and they go, oh, yeah, 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 no, it's open to everyone. You're welcome, and, and besides, you're in the U.S. for a while here. Uh, it, it's a cultural experience you need to have, and, and besides, if you don't visit a church in Texas, we shoot you, so, you know, you might as well, <laughs> you might as well just come, and, and he, he, you know, they joke with him, and he, he says, go, yeah, maybe I will. That'll be interesting, and he did, and I, I got to be honest. I think it was probably a weird cultural experience for him. I mean, he shows up, it's a very traditional Baptist church. You know, they have the, the big organ music playing, you know, shaking the place. He probably thought he'd gone in a haunted house or something. I don't know. <laughs> but he sat through that, and then he heard a very powerful message of the gospel. And he's like, light bulbs are going. And he's going, this sounds like the stuff I'm reading in this book called The Case for Christ. How interesting. And Carl's been talking about this, and that guy Mark, and he's kind of, putting these puzzle pieces together. Well, then one other thing happened with this class. Some of the people who got to know Fies a little better found out as they got to know him, he's not like a career ice cream guy. Turns out he is a med student getting his doctorate and getting, you know, learned, studying medicine. And uh, he confided in some of them. He said, I'm kind of nervous because I'm almost ready to graduate, but I haven't made good connections in the medical community. I'm going to have to go back home. I really would love to stay here. And they said, well, we could help, you know, because in our class, we got some doctors and hospital administrators. And we'll introduce you to some people. And they did. And it became a conduit for his career. It really changed Fiza's life. And it just was a very cool thing. They really served this guy lovingly. And it made a difference for him. And, you know, what I want to do is just pause the story right now and point out what I said at the beginning. There's several different things that just happened in that story. And I'm betting you can relate on a personal level to some of what some of these people did. And so let's just roll back the tapes here. And who was the first person that took action? Carl. And what did Carl do? He was very direct. Uh, you know, and this is the first of these six approaches to outreach that I want to talk about. He was direct in his approach. And by the way, not just him, but each of these have a biblical reference. And uh, there's more than one on many of these. But the one I love to talk about on this one is the Apostle Peter. Because, you know, Peter was super direct. Even right or wrong, he was direct, right? Um, but the example I love is in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, where he stands up in, in front of his big Jewish audience. And he says, you know, I've, I got to tell you, brothers, something here. He said, God sent his Messiah 
but you killed him. That's direct. You, know, you think that's pretty direct? He goes, but the Messiah you killed, you know, and you're in trouble for this, but the Messiah you killed raised back to life, and the God behind all of that loves you, and if you'll call on the name of the Lord, you can be saved. That's very direct preaching, and uh, God used it. If you know the story in Acts 2, 3,000 people come into the family. So direct people, they just like to get to the point. Now, Here's, here's where you know, this becomes really relevant. Some of you have a personality a lot like Carl's or Peter's. And maybe you're not sharing your faith yet. But you're, you, you like to get to the point. You like to create action. You know, your motto is let's make a difference or make a mess. But let's do something. Right? Can you relate to that? How many of you would say, all right, at least generically speaking, I have that kind of very direct, hard-hitting personality. Raise your hands. Okay, and how many people would say the guy next to me or the woman next to me should have raised their hand but didn't? <laughs> okay, let's just fess up here right now. All right, I just want to say to you, if you would apply that powerful personality to sharing your faith, God could use you in a powerful way, like he did Peter, like he did Carl. And by the way, I don't think I would have had the conversation with Fies if Carl hadn't stirred things up and been... Carl, and been direct. And some of you, you could, you know, again, if you, if you are willing to take the risk of getting on this unexpected adventure of the Christian life and just try it, you will see that God can use you in very direct ways and it can open doors for a bunch of the rest of us. So I want to urge you, take a risk, try it. Okay, the second person in the story was me. And what did I do? I answered questions. I gave information, I gave evidence, and we call this the intellectual approach. And this is seen in scripture as well. This is Paul, same book that we talked about earlier, Acts, but that was Acts 2 in Jerusalem. This is Acts 17 in Athens, Greece, over here with the philosopher crowd. And what, what did Paul do? He reasoned with them. And he kind of logically presented the gospel in ways that thinkers could understand and if you read the story in Acts 17, a bunch of those people ended up becoming followers of Christ. Well, that's what I do. That's so what we did yesterday all day is talked about this kind of evidence and information. It's referred to as Christian apologetics, giving a defense of your faith. And uh, at least generically speaking, a lot of you are a lot like me or like Paul in that you love information, you want to know reasons for things. You, you want to know if it makes sense. You know, we're the obnoxious types that go to a pizza place somewhere and someone goes, I wonder what that Italian name even means. And you go, that's a good question. Let me look it up. And they're going, no, 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 let's just order pizza. It's like, no, 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 let's look it up. And some of us just got to know this stuff. Can, can you relate to that? How many of you are more that kind of knowledge, figuring it out, researching people with me? Okay? God bless you. Um, we're a good group. Um, I just want to encourage you, if you would turn that, not just into Latin names of you know, pizza places or you know, other kinds of interesting information, but researching evidence and information that backs up the Christian faith, God can use you in a powerful way to remove intellectual barriers and pull people toward faith in Christ. In fact, this is needed more today than it ever has been because our culture is running the opposite direction and denying truth and challenging what we believe. We need people who will really specialize in this area and make it the main tool that you use in your outreach approach. So some of us, I hope, will specialize in that and uh, like I have, and I think it's really important. But I want to, before I go to the next one, I just want to pause and say, this one's so important. I, I think all of us, in a culture we live in today, especially as we send young people off to schools that are going to attack and try to dismantle their faith, we need to do extra prep in this area. And I often say, you know, some of our friends are two or three questions away from really, you know, having enough information to trust Christ. But some of us are two or three books away from really being ready to answer the questions. And so I brought a couple books that I think might be helpful to you, and I want to just mention those briefly. Uh, the book on the left, Confident Faith, is uh, those 20, 
Those arrows that you see represent 20 arguments for the Christian faith from science, history, philosophy, archaeology, uh, the life of Christ, things related to the Bible, and so on. Uh, and that's available to help equip you with reasons for the faith. That's our offense. And then the book on the right is my defense, and that is responding to 10 of the top objections our friends raise. And that one's called The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask. So those are some books that can help equip us, and especially I would urge you, give these to young people in your lives uh, who need some immunization against the attacks that they're going to experience. And more than that, they need to have information they can get on the offense with to try to reach their friends so they're on this unexpected adventure. And those are available out at the bookstore afterwards. I guess they're having a sale on them. Uh, and I'll be back there if you want to talk. And uh, I'll, I won't shake your hand. I had wrist surgery, but I'll give you a fist bump if you want to come by afterwards. Um, Let's go on to the third person in the story was Lee Strobel, and he wasn't even there. <laughs> but his book was there, and his influence was there, and the approach Lee uses, and so a lot of you know this because he was here, I think, six months ago and spoke and did a conference here. <laughs> Lee tells his story, right? And so the book it doesn't represent Lee's books. It represents his story, and it represents your story, your testimony. Because uh, if you're a follower of Christ, all of us who follow Christ have a story to tell. And our example on this one is uh, the blind man in John 9 who had been blind all of his life. He's begging by the side of the road. And then one fine day, Jesus comes along and heals him, gives him his sight. All of a sudden, he finds himself on trial for his faith. Uh, you know, and they're pressing him for answers about who Jesus is and by what power and authority he did this. Guy gets kind of fed up. He goes, I don't know. Give me a break. All I know is I used to be blind. Now I can see. Deal with it. You gonna argue with my experience? It's hard to argue with a good testimony, isn't it? Well, that's what Lee does, and that's what you can do. And by the way, we can all share our stories. But for some of us, this is our main approach, our main tool for sharing our faith, like it is with Lee, like it was at least at that point in that blind man's life who had been healed. Um, now, those of us with this approach, maybe we're not sharing our faith yet, but we love to speak out of our experience. We love sharing our story. What did we do last weekend? What did we do, you know, what are we doing this summer? Whatever. Um, how many of you say, that's me? I like, I like talking with friends, telling stories, remembering things, sharing my experiences with others. Well, I just want to urge you, turn that to sharing your spiritual story as well. Because your friends, if they're your friends, they're interested. In fact, they're more curious than you realize they are. A lot of our friends are really interested. They, they're kind of afraid to ask. But if we'll gently kind of say, well, can I share some of what I've been through or some of what God is doing in my life? Most people say, sure. And then you share your story, and God can use that in a powerful way. Fourth example in the story was sweet Barbara. Um, just this warm, wonderful person. What did she do? She warmed it up relationally, or what we call is the interpersonal approach. She invites uh, Fies and his family into their home. She, you know, starts getting on phone calls with his wife. Uh, she just built a friendship. And in Scripture, our example is Matthew, the tax collector, who becomes a disciple of Jesus. And you can read in Luke 5, 29, Matthew decided he, he wanted to reach his tax collecting colleagues and didn't know how, so he just had a party at his house. And he thought, I'll have a big party, I'll invite them, and I'll invite Jesus and the disciples, and we'll warm it up relationally. And I just want to say to you, and God used that, but some of you, maybe, again, you're not sharing your faith yet, but you love having people over, you've got this killer dessert recipe you love to make, and your neighbors love to eat it, and, uh, or you love to hang out at coffee shops or, or whatever. How many of you say, this, this sounds more like me, you know, hanging out at coffee shops, that's good. Um, well, let me encourage you. Think of the difference one lunch made in the life of Zacchaeus. Remember the little guy in the tree? A wee little man was he? Come on, you know the song, don't you? And uh, he, he, you know, Jesus comes along, sees him, and Jesus says, I'm having lunch at your house today. 
And Jesus used this approach in that instance. And this guy's eternity was altered by that encounter, you know, over a meal. So let me just urge you, make that dessert recipe. Invite new neighbors and old neighbors and, and people you know and people you don't know yet and warm it up and take little risks. And not only you know, will you enjoy meeting some new people, you'll get in on this adventure of being an influence in your neighborhood or your coffee shop or where, your school, wherever you do this. The fifth example in the story was the, uh, Carl and Barbara and the people in the class who invited Fies to their church. And this one we very cleverly call the invitational style. Um, not rocket science. It's just some people are good at, you know, they're enthusiastic. They get people to go places with them. And the example in the Bible is the Samaritan woman in John 4 who meets Jesus, realizes this guy's the Messiah, runs up to her town in Samaria, invites all of her friends down, and a bunch of them, along with her, become followers of Christ. So some of you are just, you know, again, maybe not sharing your faith yet, but you're, you know, whatever you get excited about, you get other people excited. New band, new movie, new restaurant, and you're just good at getting people to go. How many of you go, that's me? Well, come on, there's, you can all do this one, can't you? There, this guy right here, that's the guy. Um, we can all do this. But if we'll do it not just with a great restaurant or great movie, but with a great church or a great Christian concert or a great Christian movie or a great small group and invite them to that, God can use it powerfully. Lee Strobel came to Christ in large part because his wife invited him to church. So don't underestimate the power of an invitation. And then finally, the, the sixth style uh, is those people that got to know Fies and found out he needed connections in the medical community and they made introductions and helped him in his career. They served him, and we call this one the serving style. And the biblical example is Tabitha in Acts chapter 9 who served people by making articles of clothing uh, in, in, in the name of Christ. And the way she served made them look heavenward and say there must be a loving God. And some of you, you just enjoy serving. You love making a difference where there's a need. How many of you say, I, that I do? Okay? If you do it for Christ, if you do it in a way that says, I'm not just a nice person, I'm a follower of Jesus, that I'm, I'm motivated by the love of God, then they'll make that connection and it can draw people to Christ. And you will reach the hardest to reach people. So how did the story end? Well, let me first go to one more slide. You see what's happening? You, all have an approach. Some of you have two or three or four of these. There's no limit on this. Uh, but you could do at least one of these, couldn't you? Or maybe you have a seventh one I haven't thought of. That's cool too. Figure it out. Take some risks. Stretch yourself. Get on the adventure. And by the way, it's a team sport. You're not in this alone. You're part of a church or a group, a small group. Do this together and supplement each other the way Barbara and Carl and I and all these people were doing it. And when we do, God can use it in a powerful way. And here's the rest of the story. About a year later, one morning, Fies got up early and realized it was Sunday. And something just prompted him. I don't know what made him do it. He's got up and thought, I think we'll go visit that weird church again. <laughs> and so he woke up his wife and woke up his daughter and said, hey, we're going to go to that church. He's going, I thought we were Muslims. He goes, yeah, I, th I think we are, but let's just go. So okay. They went. Fies, his wife, his six-year-old daughter, went in this church as Muslims, heard a message that according to Romans 1.16 is the power of God unto salvation, the gospel message. And about an hour later, Fies, his wife, and his six-year-old daughter went out of that church as followers of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's about, isn't it? And that's the kind of activity God wants to do through you. And I'm telling you, it's an adventure. I mean, I, Carl calls me and tells me, I'm going, I had a part in that. I was there. I, you know, it's like, what's better than making a difference in someone's life and family and future and eternity? There's no adventure like it. 
But the final thing I want to say, you know, if you're a follower of Christ, get in on that adventure. That's great. But maybe you're none of those. Maybe the person in the story you can best relate to is Fies. You know, whether you're Muslim or you're, you're just a, you don't believe in Christ or you're an atheist or agnostic or part of another religion, you're, you're going, I, I'm not going to share any of this. I, I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. And I want to say, I'm glad you're here. You couldn't have come to a better place. This is a church full of people that will encourage you and challenge you and feed you and, you know, walk with you and, and encourage you and pray for you and serve you and do all all of these things we've been talking about. And I just want to urge you like Fies to open up to it and to say, God, have your way in my life. Maybe the unexpected adventure for me is to do what Fies did and say yes to Christ. And I hope it will be. Let's pray. Father, I pray for that. And I pray if any don't know you today that they would be attracted to the beauty of Christ and to the church and that they would say yes to you the way uh, Fies did. And for the rest of us, Lord, give us the excitement and the courage to take small risks, to share our faith and get on in on this unexpected adventure of sharing you with many. Make us fruitful and use us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we thank Mark? Thank you. Thank you.